in there. Well, Exodus chapter 37 this evening. We're going to do the next two chapters, 37 and 38 tonight, and uh, um, we'll see what the Lord's got in store for us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much just for tonight, for bringing us here together as your people. Lord, that your word is still standing strong today, that it will not return void when we open it up, when we study it, that it's living, breathing, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And so, Lord, tonight I pray that um, whatever's been going on throughout the week in our lives, I pray we would uh, lay those things down at your feet knowing that you are our Father and you care. You desire to take our burdens from us and you desire to encourage us. You desire to convict us where we need conviction. Lord, to build us up, to equip us for the work of the ministry. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Exodus chapter 37, starting in verse one. Then Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits was its length and a cubit and a half its width and a cubit and a half its height. He overlaid it with pure gold inside and outside and made a molding of gold all around it. And he cast for it four rings of gold to be set in its four corners, two rings on one side and two rings on the other side of it. He made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. And he put the poles into the rings at the sides of the ark to bear the ark. He also made the mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits was its length and a cubit and a half its width. He made two cherubim of beaten gold. He made them of one piece at the two ends of the mercy seat. One cherub at one end on this side and the other cherub at the other end on that side. He made the cherubim at the two ends of the one piece with the mercy seat. The cherubim spread out their wings above and covered the mercy seat with their wings. They faced one another. The faces of the cherubim were toward the mercy seat. Now, to be honest, tonight, as we get through these next two chapters and even the last two chapters of Exodus, there's a lot of measurements. There's a lot of construction going on. Uh, but if we focus and we pay attention, we can see there's a lot in here for us. As we saw last time, the children of Israel were now actually starting to build their tabernacle and the different items associated with it. Bezalel, who we see here in verse 1, is the master craftsman that the Lord had filled with his spirit and with wisdom so that he could do what the Lord had called him to do. We first saw that in chapter 31. The Lord calls him by name. He says, I have set out, uh, picked out for me Bezalel, who I filled with my spirit and the spirit of wisdom, a master craftsman to do the work of the tabernacle. And we, we, as we've been studying that and seeing that, we have saw how he was one of the first people in the Bible mentioned to specifically be filled with the Spirit. Not that others before him hadn't, who wasn't the first one, but one of the first ones mentioned. And he wasn't a priest. He wasn't one of the leaders. He was essentially a construction worker, as we'll see tonight. That's the guy who the Lord decided to fill with his spirit to do this master craftsman work. And it just goes to show that no matter what the Lord has called us to do, he's gonna fill us with his spirit to do it. Whether we're up here leading worship or teaching the scriptures or maybe on August 26th from 10 to 1, you're here for the church work day. <laughs> the Lord's gonna fill us with our, his spirit to do the work that he's called us to do. See, not everyone could be a priest, but not everyone needed to be a priest. Bezalel had his calling and the Lord equipped him to do it. And here he's building the ark, which would eventually be one of the most holy things in the nation of Israel. It was something that they treasured, something that they prized. In fact, almost too much to the point where they would start bringing it on the battlefield thinking the ark is what brought them luck. Kind of like a good luck charm. What ended up happening because they started worshiping the creation rather than the creator, like Paul mentions in Romans chapter one. Well, this ark that they prized so much that eventually they really prized more than they prized the Lord, the ark was taken from them. Oh no, what do we do? 
Now, just because the ark was used in an improper manner doesn't mean it's a bad thing. In fact, it was important because it represented the physical presence of God on earth. The Ark of the Covenant is where they would put some of their most holy things, the staff of Aaron that budded, the two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. All of these things that pointed to work that only the Lord had done and only the Lord could do. The way that Bezalel makes this, if you'll notice, he makes it so that no one would touch it when they carried it. So basically it was this big box and it had four rings on each side of the box and then he made poles that would go through the rings so that way when they needed to carry it and move it, they didn't actually touch the actual ark but they put the poles through the rings and then they carried it on the poles. Now that's important because later on when King David goes to actually move the ark, one of the people there as they're moving the ark, instead of carrying the priest carrying it on the poles, they put it on an oxen cart, which they weren't supposed to do. As they're going over the roads and they go over a little bump, one of the guys goes to touch it to kind of you know, keep it centered so it doesn't fall over. You know, he had good intentions. Well, because he touched it, the Lord struck him down and he died. We have to be careful that uh, sometimes even with our intentions, we're not being disobedient to the Lord. Well, you know, I have good intentions. The Lord will see my intentions. Well, if your intentions go against Scripture, <laughs> there's no such thing as good intentions then. And so he makes it just like the Lord had prescribed. So moving on, we'll see the next thing that he makes. Verse 10. He made the table of acacia wood. Two cubits was its length, a cubit its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And he overlaid it with pure gold and he made a molding of gold all around it. Also, he made a frame of a hand breadth all around it and made a molding of gold for the frame all around it. And he cast for it four rings of gold and put the rings on the four corners that were at its four legs. The rings were close to the frame as holders for the poles to bear the table. And he made the poles of acacia wood to bear the table and overlaid them with gold. He made of pure gold the utensils which were on the table, its dishes, its cups, its bowls, and its pitchers for pouring. The next thing that we see here that was made was the table for the showbread, the holy bread. This, like the ark, was covered completely in gold to show that it was holy. Gold in that time was not something that a lot of people had. They didn't, it wasn't common uh, later on. Um, when Solomon's king of Israel, we'll see it's a lot more common. Um, he was very rich, very rich with lots of gold. But gold in this sense was used to signify holiness, purity. Because to get the gold ore out of the rocks, you had to purify it. You had to make it pure, holy, set apart for a specific thing. And there is going to be a difference as we get, get later on in chapter 38. We'll see that some of the other things he doesn't make with gold. And there's a reason for that. So like the ark, it was completely covered in gold. This would be where they would set the holy bread. They would set the holy bread for a whole week and change it out every other week. For a whole week, the Lord would preserve this bread. They didn't have preservatives like we have nowadays. They didn't have refrigeration like we had nowadays. And so he make, makes this and all the utensils that go with it completely out of gold. Verse 17, we'll continue. He also made the lampstand of pure gold. Of hammered work, he made the lampstand. Its shafts, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs, and its flowers were of the same piece. And six branches came out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand out of one side and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. There were three bowls made like almond blossoms on one branch with an ornamental knob and a flower and three bowls made like almond blossoms on the other branch with an ornamental knob and a flower and so for the six branches coming out of the lampstand. And on the lampstand itself were four bowls made like almond blossoms each with its ornamental knob and flower. 
There was a knob under the first two branches of the same, a knob under the second two branches of the same, and a knob under the third two branches of the same, according to the six branches extending from it. Their knobs and their branches were of one piece. All of it was one hammered piece of pure gold. And he made its seven lamps, its wick trimmers, and its trays of pure gold. Of a talent of pure gold he made it with all its utensils. So the next piece that he makes for the tabernacle is the lampstand. This would stand in the tabernacle and it would always be lit. In fact, it, would, it was part of the priest's job to make sure that the candle never went out. They had to constantly be trimming the branches, make sure there was enough oil. And that's because it represented something very important. It was a reminder to the children of Israel of the brightness of the Lord. That in him there is no darkness at all. When they entered into the place that represented the presence of the Lord, it was a place that was lit, not a dark place. In fact, it was done by many of the contemporary pagan religions. Things were done in the dark. Things were done in secret. In fact, you'll see that many times throughout the Old Testament where the Lord calls out the children of Israel for doing things in the dark, doing things in secret. He's referring to some of the pagan practices that were done. These things weren't done in light. These things weren't done in brightness at all. And so every time they entered in, the place was lit up. We see this throughout Scripture that wherever the presence of the Lord is, there is light. There is no darkness. He doesn't do anything, again, in secret. He doesn't do anything hidden like that. It's bright, it's apparent, it's known. In fact, we see the greatest example of that in Jesus Christ, the light of the world, coming down to expose the darkness. Everywhere he went, he exposed the darkness. Yes, there are many today who seem to think that when Jesus was on this earth, he was loving and accepting of anything and everything. No, all he did was he exposed the darkness. He did it to Pharisees. He did it to his disciples. He did it to the Samaritan woman at the well. He did it at the, to the tax collectors when he's eating with the tax collectors and the prost, uh, prostitutes. His light was there exposing their sin. And wherever the Lord is today, which if he's in you, then you're a carrier of the light. You're a a bearer of that light. We're there exposing darkness. Many of us have probably been the subject or the butt of the joke, um, whether it's, amongst our family or friends or coworkers, where you know you walk into the room and oh gosh guys let's let's uh let's stop cussing now let's stop the dirty jokes now let's stop this let's stop that why because you know the christian over here and you didn't say anything you didn't scoff you didn't do anything but your presence your light was made known and so here he is bezalel the master craftsman, making this lampstand of pure gold. And really, it's, it's a talented thing he does here. It says that it's all of one work. It's all of one piece of gold that he makes this. He doesn't you know, make the different pieces and then put them together. It's all made out of one. I mean, it's a pretty impressive thing. I'm not a craftsman myself, but I know that much at least. Well, continuing on in verse 25. He made the incense altar of acacia wood. Its length was a cubit and its width a cubit. It was square and two cubits was its height. Its horns were of one piece with it and he overlaid it with pure gold, its top, its sides all around and its horns. He also made for it a molding of gold all around it. He made two rings of gold for it under its molding by its two corners on both sides as holders for the poles with which to bear it. And he made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. He also made the holy anointing oil and the pure incense of sweet spices according to the work of the perfumer. 
So the next thing he makes is the altar of incense. This is where they would burn incense to the Lord as a sweet smelling aroma. So not only when they would go in there would it be lit and nice and bright, but also it smelled pretty good. Which is good because we also know that in there they would be offering sacrifices. It was a kind of also a bloody scene, although probably smelling pretty good, like, you know, if you like the smell of barbecue. I don't know if you ever, you know, drive down Wheaton Street on like a Saturday and there's that rib shack, Randy's, um, and you drive by, we drove by a couple weeks ago and just, I had to roll down the window because you just get that puff of smoke that comes right in and I'm just reminded, that's the smell the Lord loves. (laughs) Just like you and me, he loves that smell. Well, to kind of cover up all of that, They also had sweet smelling incense. And so he builds this altar of incense and he also makes the oil, the anointing oil and the incense, which we saw last time he gave what, you know, what those are made of, the recipes for those things. But as we also saw last time with these, this incense and the anointing oil, this was only to be used for the Lord in the tabernacle. You couldn't go down to the local market and say, hey, can I get you know, the, the, uh, the tabernacle incense? You know, Me and my wife's 25th anniversary is coming up and I wanna smell good for her as we go out on the town. And so could I get the tabernacle incense? She really likes that. No, you couldn't do it. You couldn't copy it. There was no substitute for it. There is no substitute for the Lord. It was supposed to be a set apart and holy. So when you smelt that incense... When you smelt that anointing oil, you knew exactly what it was for. When you smelt the incense as you're maybe walking around the camp, you'd say, oh, they're offering something to the Lord. When someone would come up to you and you could smell that anointing oil on them, you could say, you know what? This person has been set apart for the work of the ministry of the Lord. They smell different, literally. There is something different about them. Throughout the New Testament, we're told that as believers, we've all been anointed with the Holy Spirit. And that anointing is something that can't be substituted with anything else in this world. It can't be made up by man. If you remember in the book of Acts, when Peter and and, um, John... uh, Peter and James are going around and they're casting out demons and healing the sick and doing all this stuff and giving people the power of the Holy Spirit. Simon the sorcerer comes up and says, hey, you know, how can I get that power? I'd love to be able to use that in my next show. I'd love to be able to sell that. How much do you want for it? And they told him in a pretty, uh, pretty upfront way that it's not for sale. It's not something that we possess to give you for sale. It's something only the Lord can do. It's directly from heaven. It's not something made on earth with hands. It's something only from the Lord and for the Lord. Right, it was the Lord who gave this recipe for the anointing oil and for the incense. You know, Moses wasn't like, you know, Lord, I really love the smell of jasmine. Do you think we can put some jasmine in there? Hey, Lord, you know, some thyme would be really nice if we kind of season that meat that we're offering to you with some thyme, you know, maybe some butter, some garlic. And No, it was the Lord who said, this is exactly what you need to do. And for us as believers, we should have that same smelling aroma. The New Testament says that our lives should be a sweet smelling aroma to the Lord. That the Lord sees it. Not just the Lord, but people smell it. Not literally, not that there's some, you know, Christian cologne. You know, I, I'm sure there's those, there's some charlatans out there selling the Christian cologne, you know. Smell like a believer today. You know, six payments of 1999. But that's not what we're, that's not what we're speaking of here. What we're speaking of is our lives will be different. People will see the difference. There's a difference in their life. They have a different smell. They have a different walk. They have a different talk. And it's to only be used for the Lord. Well, chapter 38, he's still making stuff. 
Verse one, and he made the altar of burnt offering of acacia wood. Five cubits was its length and five cubits its width. It was square and its height was three cubits. He made its horns on its four corners. The horns were of one piece with it and he overlaid it, now notice this, with bronze, not gold. He overlaid all the, he made, he made all the utensils for the altar, the pans, the shovels, the basins, the forks and the fire pans and all its utensils he made of bronze. And he made a grate of bronze network for the altar under its rim, midway from the bottom. He cast four rings for the four corners of the bronze grating as holders for the poles. And he made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with bronze. Then he put the poles into the rings on the sides of the altar with which to bear it. And he made the altar hollow with the boards. He made the laver of bronze and its base of bronze with the bronze mirror on the sur- of the serving women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So these next two pieces that he makes is the altar for the burnt offering in the bronze basin which they would use to wash up before they would, um, before and after making these offerings. Now the noticeable difference, as I pointed out when I read it, in these two pieces and the ones before is that these are not made out of gold but they're made out of bronze. Bronze or brass, they're interchangeable a lot of times in the Bible, are symbols of judgment. These things, the, bron- the burnt offering and the basin, they had to do with the people. Whereas the things that we just read, the lampstand, the Ark of the Covenant, the altar of incense, all of these had to do with the Lord. The altar of incense, for example, was, again, something they put incense in. It was a a sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord. It was an offering to the Lord. It wasn't for their sins they were burning the incense. It wasn't, you know, to be on good standing with God. It was just because, hey, God liked the incense. The lampstand we saw represented the light from the Lord, and the Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of the Lord. So all of those things, gold, holy, pure, But now we come to the altar of the burnt offering. This is where they would set the animal, burn the animal, and why would would they burn this animal? Because their sins needed to be atoned for. It was on an altar of judgment that they're doing this now. These things had to do with the people washing themselves both physically and spiritually. It was a sign of judgment. This would be the place where judgment would take place for their sins. But instead of them being placed on the altar, they would place an animal in their their stead. And so we see bronze being used, a sign of judgment for the people. Again, there is a difference between the things for the Lord and the things for people. We have to be careful that we don't mix the two. Now in verse nine, we'll see the rest of the tabernacle being built. Then he made the court on the south side. The hangings on the court were of fine woven linen, 100 cubits long. They were 20 pillars for them with 20 bronze sockets. The hooks of the pillars and their bands were silver. On the north side, the hangings were 100 cubits long with 20 pillars and their 20 bronze sockets. The hooks of the pillars and their bands were silver. And on the west side, there were hangings of 50 cubits with 10 pillars and their 10 sockets. The hooks of the pillars and their bands were silver. For the east side, the hangings were 50 cubits. The hangings of one side of the gate were 15 cubits long with their three pillars and their three sockets. And the same for the other side of the court gate, on this side that were hanging of 15 cubits, with their three pillars and their three sockets. All the hangings of the court, all around, were of fine woven linen. The sockets for the pillars were bronze, the hooks of the pillars and their bands were silver, and the overlay of their capitals was silver, and all the pillars of the court had bands of silver. The screen for the gate of the court was woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and of fine woven linen. The length was 20 cubits and the height along its width was five cubits, corresponding to the hangings of the court. 
And there were four pillars with their four sockets of bronze. Their hooks were silver, and the overlay of their capitals and their bands was silver. All the pegs of the tabernacle and all the court all around were of bronze. Now this is the inventory of the tabernacle. The tabernacle of the testimony, which was counted according to the commandment of Moses for the service of the Levites by the hand of Ithamar, son of Aaron, the priest. Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, made all that the Lord had commanded Moses. And with him was a ha- a ha- I always get this one wrong. <laughs> Ahoeliab, the son of Ahisamach, the tribe of Dan, an engraver and designer, a weaver of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and of fine linen. All the gold that was used in all the work of the holy place, that is, the gold of the offering, was 29 talents and 730 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. And the silver from those who were numbered of the congregation was 100 talents and 1,775 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. A becca for each man, that is half a shekel, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, for everyone included in the numbering, from 20 years old and above, for 603,550 men. And from the hundred talents of silver were cast the sockets of the sanctuary and the bases of the veil, one hundred sockets from the hundred talents, one talent for each socket. Then from the one thousand seven hundred and seventy-five shekels he made hooks for the pillars, overlaid their capitals, and made bands for them. The offering of bronze was seventy talents and two thousand four hundred shekels, and with it he made the sockets for the door of the tabernacle of meeting, the bronze altar, the bronze grating for it, and all the utensils for the altar, the sockets for the court all around, and bases for the court gate, all the pegs of the tabernacle, and all the pegs for the court around. Now, as we can see here, the rest of the tabernacle is finally built. And we've probably gone over, I think this is the third time we've gone over the dimensions and how everything was built and how it was put together. The thing to note about it is, as is, again, this is probably our third time going over this. Every time before this, when the Lord would say this, they said to do this exactly as the Lord commanded. Do this exactly as the Lord commanded. There was no artistic interpretation. Bezalel was filled with the Spirit by the Lord, equipped to do this specific work, and he was to do it exactly as the Lord commanded. And again, this is very important, that once he has this done, he does it exactly as the Lord commanded. Throughout Scripture, there are many times where those that are called and even anointed by the Lord end up going and doing their own thing their own way, and it never works. In fact, Moses is going to find this out a little later on. Moses, earlier we saw him strike the rock, and from the rock there came water flowing when the people were thirsty. Well, later on, they're going to come across the same problem. And this time, the Lord's going to tell Moses, Moses, don't strike the rock, but speak to the rock, and water will flow from it. But what happens? Moses gets to the rock. The people are grumbling and complaining. You know, Moses probably hasn't slept in days or something like that. And he gets to the rock, and he just starts boom, boom, and strikes the rock twice. The crazy thing is, is water flows out. The Lord was still faithful to do what he said he would do, but Moses was unfaithful. And because of that single action, even though Moses was called to lead the people of Israel, even though Moses was anointed, because of that action, the Lord tells Moses, because you disobeyed my commandment in front of all the people, you will no longer, you will not be able to see, and you will not be able to enter into the promised land. He was able to see it. The Lord took him up on a high mountain and said, see Moses, look at what your people are about to enter into, but you will not enter in. Another time we see King Saul. King Saul thinks he's the man. He's the first king in Israel, right? He's the tallest. He's been anointed by Samuel the prophet. I mean, his life couldn't be any better at this point. And he just defeated the Amalekites. Except the Lord said, when you defeat the Amalekites, utterly wipe them out. Kill everyone, man, woman, child, 
and all of their cattle. Don't leave any of them alive. Pretty harsh. Well, Saul defeats them, but when it comes to wiping them out like the Lord had said, Saul goes, you know what I think the Lord would really like? Some burnt offerings. And so I'm gonna save some of this choice because I mean, I can't give up this, you know, Wagyu steak. I mean, the Lord loves burnt offerings and I've got prime cut right here. Let's offer some of this up. Let's not put this to waste. While also keeping some Amalekites alive, by the way. When Samuel... Samuel the prophet said, I'm gonna come at this time and just wait for me before, before anything happens. And all of a sudden, as he's walking up, he, hears Saul, he, he can smell the burnt offering and hear the neighing of the sheep and the mooing of the cows. And he gets up to Saul and Saul goes, you know, hey Samuel, check this out. You know, it, it's so, we're so blessed. We just defeated the Amalekites. And look what I'm doing, Samuel. I'm offering up all these amazing things to the Lord. Isn't the Lord so proud of me? I mean, on paper, it looked great, right? If you didn't know that, that the Lord had told Saul to completely wipe them out, you'd think, man, Saul is on a tear lately. He's just serving the Lord. He's offering these burn, I, I want, he, you're telling your kids, you need to be like King Saul. He's a great guy to look up to. But see, King Saul went and did it. Even though he was called, even though he was anointed king, he still disobeyed the Lord and went and did his own thing his own artistic interpretation of what the Lord would want. We can't go outside those lines. Saul's intentions might have been great. I mean, again, it looked like he really wanted to offer those things up to the Lord, but when Samuel gets to him, he says, no, Saul, no. And because you've disobeyed the Lord, Samuel walks away and as he's walking away Saul grabs him by the robe and Samuel rip Samuel runs away and Saul rips his robe and Samuel goes and tells him like you have ripped my robe the Lord is going to rip the kingdom from your hands and give it to someone else who will obey me and that's when David comes in and that's a great story But again, they, they, they looked great, looked good. But with Bezalel, he did everything as the Lord commanded. Everything. God has given us very specific instructions on a lot of things. And we as his children are not allowed to go outside those bounds without consequences. If you are a child of God, the book of Hebrews says that he will chastise you. He will discipline you. And actually, you should count that a good thing if you get disciplined by God because that means you're his child. Because you know who he doesn't discipline? You know who he doesn't chastise? Those who aren't his children. The guy getting away with sin all the time? I'm getting away with it. God must really bless me and anoint me. No, you must not be a child of God. Because one thing we are promised as his children is discipline for stepping outside the bounds. Now we know Moses, Moses in the hall of faith, Moses was still saved even though he did that, he disobeyed God. There's a lot of... um, conjecture about King Saul. Some say that the Lord would have had mercy and grace on him and he's in heaven today. Others say no, he's, he's a prime example of, of being as close as you can get without getting there. I, I don't know. I'm not gonna, uh, I have my own opinions but they're worth nothing. The thing to take note of is that we don't walk outside the lane the Lord has set before us. We don't go outside the directions he's given us for life. And he's given us his word as we've, we've seen these past few weeks, 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17, that we have the inspired word of God that's good for everything in our life. It is our guidebook, it is our handbook, it's our mirror to show us 
where we've went wrong. You know, one thing me and my boys love doing is building Legos together. And the thing with Legos is if you don't follow those directions with the pieces they've given you, your whole build will be messed up. And one thing I can't stand is when I, you know, when we're building it and we miss a part and we, you know, get six pages down and it's time to put some more things together and it won't go together and none of it's working out and we start looking at the build and we say, oh, we went outside, we didn't add this piece or we put this piece in the wrong place and now what has to happen? You gotta take the whole thing apart again. Start all, you know, almost all the way from the beginning. Go back to that part where you missed. You can't freestyle it. It's the same with the Lord. Is there's many times in our life we've disobeyed and it's already been a year, a month, a week, and however long it's been, and we just realize that, oh, that was from back then when I did that. Now those consequences are catching up to me. Now I can't enter into that that rest that the Lord has promised, like he said to to Moses, you will not enter into the promised land. But we see with Bezalel and those with him that they were given the ability to do the work and they didn't waste that ability. And every one of us has been equipped and given the ability to do the work that he has called us to do. Ephesians 2.10, that he has planned beforehand good works that we should walk in them. That's a promise for every believer. And he's given us all the ability and the equipping to do that work. And we can't waste that ability, either with our own interpretation of what we think we should do or what we think God would like, but we just have to obey exactly how he says it. Again, he's already planned it out. Good works beforehand that we should walk. You know, I I love that verse because I, you know, sometimes I'll wake up and say, Lord, what good works do you have planned for me today? And and I pray I don't mess it up. (laughs) I pray I don't miss them like I a lot of times do. Let's be good stewards of what the Lord has given us. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much just for your word that it gives us all that we need. Lord, to live this life. And you've given us the plans, you've given us the instructions, and we just need to walk in them. Lord, I pray right now for us the rest of this week, you would fill us with your spirit to do the work that you've called us to do. Wherever you have planted us, Lord, that we would bear fruit because we're abiding in you. Lord, I pray that you would continue to work in our lives, work in us, Lord, and work through us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.